in the way of war fiction? You know, I read a lot of war fiction when I was a teenager, very different from this, all those Second World War books about, you know, um, Battle of Britain and officers escaping from camps. I don't know what I'd have made of this at that age, but I thought it was, um, I thought it was a wonderful book. I wouldn't say it has no narrative. I mean, it does have a sort of narrative frame in that they start off in camp in England and then they go across the Channel and then they fight. He does, I mean, there's quite a few characters that I, I warmed to because he does, although no character take centre stage he, these little vignettes do really bring some of the characters to life mm. don't they and i too found it moving i mean it moved me to tears a couple of times funnily enough both times when they were singing when the when the um senior officer hears the men singing so <laughs> and um and and then again in france where they're celebrating 14th of july with the with the french villagers i thought it was beautifully written and I don't want to put anybody off by saying that it's poetic, but actually a couple of times when I thought this is like a poem in a good way, the way he uses repetition, and if you notice in the first chapter he practically repeats certain sentences, and then there's this wonderful passage which appears in the prologue and again at the end, which is when the, the, they're just going to their sort of big encounter the, over the ridge, their big encounter with the Germans. The first light stealing over the ridge touched the black fringe of treetops up on the hillside and a multitude of birds awoke to shrill song. There was no other sound in the morning. And that and the paragraph before it appear entire later in the book when this, we actually get to this bit that we've, we've been given the foresight of in, in the prologue. It's interesting, isn't it? Because that image of birdsong has now become almost a cliché of World War I. And in some ways, I thought this book had the quality of some of the First World War poetry and the writing about the First World War because it's not nothing to do with heroics and escaping and all that sort of thing. Mm. I, I was just so glad, Brian, that you'd introduced me to it. I thought it was extraordinary. And, I mean, it's absolutely gripping from the beginning, despite not having a central character, despite not having a kind of driven plot. And at the end, I was, I think, literally stunned. I was just sitting there with the book in my lap, immobile, as I'd had an electric shock through me, because it is one of the most devastating pictures of the human cost of war. And what is so extraordinary about it is that it is that, but it isn't an anti-war novel, is it? Well, I, I, I knew that you'd done national service. I mean, obviously, you were too young to be fighting in the Second War, but you, you, you know a bit more about the military than I do. And I just thought, and I hope that you confirm this, that this seemed so remarkably authentic. I mean, we've talked a lot about the tragedy of the book, but in its comedy as well, there's this wonderful, the Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Pothecary, who's in charge of this, of this um, group of soldiers. He's giving them a pep talk. This is just before they move over to Normandy and he says you know keep cheerful that goes a long way keep your heads down when you can only take risks when you have to he hesitated again searching for a peroration and ended triumphantly eat when you can and keep your bowels open that's all lads fall the battalion out sergeant major and I just thought that you had to have been in the army to know that a colonel was liable to say that. I mean, it is it is a very real picture, isn't but it? But he is a nice character. I mean, and one thing I liked was that the officers were not all made into hard-hearted buffoons. I mean, Colonel Pothecary is actually a very sympathetic character who really cares about his men. We've been talking about From the City, From the Plough by Alexander Barron. And we're going to move now from the sublime to the ridiculous because the book I've chosen is a detective novel it's called The Moving Toy Shop and it is a bit of nonsense it's by a, a writer called Edmund Crispin who nobody seems to have heard of much these days but he's actually a very interesting man he had a, a second life as a composer he was under his real name Bruce Montgomery he composed choral music and also uh, oddly enough he composed the, the music for, the, for several carry-on films but Maybe that isn't so odd because his detective fiction is very playful and silly and, I think, utterly enjoyable. I mean, the, the plot of this book, The Moving Toy Shop, involves, for reasons too complicated to go into, a middle-aged poet, or at least a fairly young poet, I think, having a midlife crisis at 37. He's walking through the streets of Oxford at night. He comes across a toy shop whose door happens to be open. And instead of just walking past, he goes in, finds a body, is knocked on the head, wakes up from unconsciousness, escapes through the shop through a back window, fetches the police, because obviously a murder has happened. They arrive back at the shop and, lo and behold, it isn't a toy shop any longer. It's become a grocer's shop. 
The police obviously think he's mad, but he calls in uh, the services of his friend Gervais Fenn, who is Professor of English Language and Literature at Oxford. And Gervais also happens to be Edmund Crispin's series amateur detective, and gradually between them they sort the whole thing out. I love this sort of thing, but I wonder, Wendy Cope, whether it's your cup of tea at all. Well, I do like crime fiction, and actually I had read this before, but not recently enough to be able to talk about it without reading it again. And so... Actually, my heart sank when I saw what you'd chosen. I thought it was going to be very boring to read it twice. But in fact, I'd forgotten almost everything. So that wasn't really a problem. I think it did certainly do what I, what I think crime fiction ought to do, which is when I got to the last 50 pages, I was so gripped wanting to know the answer um, that I couldn't put it down. Having said that, I mean, yes, it is playful and silly. And actually, at times, I find it quite irritating. This Gervais Fenn, the way he kept quoting the white rabbit and saying oh my dear paws my it, paws and whiskers oh, my yeah, paws, yeah, yeah. Um, i think the flavor of um undergraduate hijinks about it and i suppose that i mean yes i would give it beta plus as crime fiction it's certainly readable i quite enjoyed reading it a second time but what i found interesting about this book is that it is both very dated and very well actually more than modern it's it's postmodern it's got all these mm. sort of metafictional games going on in it Let's turn point, left. This book is going to be published by Golance. Well, yeah. I- exactly, which I think is very funny. I mean, maybe if you don't, if you're young enough not to know that Golance is um, a left-wing publisher, it isn't so amusing. Or there's a there's a point where Gervais Fenn is sitting there muttering to himself, and his friend the poet asks him what he's doing, and he's trying to think up titles for Edmund Crispin yes. books. Yes. But I think what I quite like as well, in fact, more than quite like actually, what I've always liked about Ed- Edmund Crispin and Gervais Fenn is that he is not a goody, this guy, this professor. He's not, you know, he's not Albert Campion. He's not Hercule Poirot. He's a quite nasty character in many ways. He's sort of like an adult toddler. He's full of this ferocious, destructive energy, utterly utterly self-centred and ruthless. I mean, isn't there something about him that is quite refreshing, Wendy? I think, you know, in any novel I read, I like there to be at least one character that I can like. I mean, I do have a problem, and I think this is one of my problems with it, that there aren't any likeable characters in it at all. And that's something I miss. I think that's entirely true. I mean, I I find it fun. I really find it fun. And I also think that he writes really well, Edmund Crispin. There's a, there's a terrific scene towards the end when the goodies and the baddies have encountered each other on, for some reason, a merry-go-round, which is kind of worthy... I think, of, you know, sort of Graham Greene or Patricia Highsmith or something. Don't you think he's quite a nifty writer? But, I mean, I've read crime fiction that I liked better. Well, I just want to make one last plea for him as a, as a writer. I mean, not a showy writer, but there's, for instance, there's a scene towards the end where they're on a punt and somebody has just been made to confess that he dumped the body of this unfortunate woman in the river. It just says it was twilight, a bat was flying, the piercing chatter of the crickets never ceased, and far away in the town the clocks were striking half past seven. The river water was black now, and the small fishes would be clinging to the woman's eyes. It's sort of, you know, pastoral evening, and then this... Well, Wendy Cope, your choice. Uh, My choice is a book I think has a very beautiful title, Evening in the Palace of Reason. It's by James Gaines, and this is non-fiction. It's a biography of two men who lived at the same time and only met once, and one of them is Frederick the Great of Prussia, and the other is Johann Sebastian Bach. They met once in 1747 when Bach visited Frederick in Potsdam, and Frederick issued a challenge to Bach. To he, He played this very rather long, complicated theme and challenged Bach to make up a three-part fugue which Bach did instantly, he improvised it. And then Frederick said, well, how about a six-part fugue? And everyone there thought this is a bit unfair. But anyway, Bach, he didn't do it immediately, but he went off. And within a fortnight, he composed this, I think, wonderful work called A Musical Offering, which he sent to Frederick. And there's no evidence that Frederick ever listened to it. But who cares? Because, you know, I'm really, um, it is a wonderful piece of music. So we get the story of that meeting right at the beginning and then he goes back and he fills in the background in alternate chapters. We get the life of Frederick the Great, we get the life of Bach. Now, when I heard about this book, when it first came out, I bought it because I'm interested in Bach. I wouldn't have picked up a book about Frederick the Great of Prussia, but actually I found those bits really interesting as well.
I sort of had a vague idea that Frederick was a good guy because he was a patron of the arts and a friend of Voltaire's. It turned out he wasn't quite such a good guy as I thought. He had a, he had a terrible childhood that turned him into a not very nice person and Voltaire and he had rather a poisonous relationship. But I think particularly that James Gaines writes absolutely wonderfully about music and I have recommended this book to people who know more about music than I do and they have agreed with me. I thought it was a wonderfully sprightly read given that it is, uh, it's a history, it's two biographies, it's also the account of a philosophical discussion, I mean basically Mm. God or not God which is still going on in a slightly different form and it is as you say Wendy I think an excellent, excellent commentary on Bach about whom I know very little because I know very little and shamefully little about classical music. And I think for me, actually, that was probably probably the big, the big richness of this book was that I was thinking, oh, not just Bach, but Baroque music generally. Yeah. Oh, I see, I see, I understand. I understand what's going on there. However, I have to say that I think Bach himself comes across as a really rather awful, boring person. I mean, is that fair? He was easily upset. Well, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I think, yes. I mean, what appalls me in reading this, I mean, I knew that Bach's music was neglected for a long time after he died until it was rediscovered by Mendelssohn. But the extent to which Bach was undervalued in his life The fact that his employers docked his salary a few weeks after the first performance of the St Matthew Passion. The fact that towards his, you know, as he got older, young critics were writing things like, a composer of turgid, outdated music and an undereducated social climber, an uneducated social climber. He, he Um, He did have reasons, it's perfectly true, to have a chip on his shoulder, but the sense you get is of somebody for whom everything's always wrong, he endlessly is sending off memos and letters to his employers and he saying, you know... badly treated by his employers. <laughs> well, OK, that, the rights or wrongs of it may well be the case. Well, I'm afraid I did, I have to say, Wendy, enjoy I'm the custard on you, the... Because what I did wonder was, so you say you, you're not very into classical music, and what I wondered I'm was... I'm sadly, sadly ill-informed. It's what not I, I wondered I don't like was it. whether this would be boring for somebody who's not very interested in classical music, but actually it seems to have worked for you. No, it, it absolutely worked, and what was quite interesting is Gaines' frustration every so often, because he says, really now, stop reading, get up, go and find a CD, put it on, or a vinyl, or whatever it is you play, and listen to some Bach. And actually it was the best argument I've ever come across for electronic readers because clearly what you want at this point is an electronic text and you can click onto the title of some piece of Bach's music and listen to it. I do think that it's um, on the music very enlightening. What I was less convinced by however which is the conclusion that Gaines reaches really through the music which is that if Bach's music is just so beautiful and so sublime and people are so moved by it this of itself I don't think he says actually proves the existence of God, but he strongly much, indicates... He pretty much it. does say that, and I certainly don't go along with that. No, I mean, the, the, the logic seems to me entirely flawed on that. Mm. Anything in that, Wendy, that it is two books that have been forcibly yoked together? I just found it completely absorbing. German history before the 19th century is very hard to grasp because of all the different little states, you know, and so I think, it, it, I, I know, feel I know a little bit more about that now. And, um, you know, it worked, no, the yoking together worked for me, that's all I can say. Well, we've been talking about Evening in the Palace of Reason by James Gaines, and that's published by Harper Perennial at 11.99. Also on the programme, we were talking about From the City, From the Plough by Alexander Barron from Black Spring Press at 9.99, and The Moving Toy Shop by Edmund Crispin, published by Vintage at 7.99. Now, this one, very, very interesting one, it's not really an everyday scientific mystery. Well, no. Maybe it will become such in the future if we go (laughs) off gallivanting about the universe. But it's one of those questions that that was so interesting and got us got our brains racing so hard that we felt that we had to do it. And the question was fundamentally what would happen if you threw someone into a black hole? And for reasons unbeknownst to me. Adam and our producer, Michelle Martin, colluded together <laughs> to make it all about chucking me into a black hole. We, we, we conducted a thought experiment which involved throwing Hannah into a black hole to see what would happen. And the answer was, well, it's not great, but let's find out. 
Yes, and it goes like this. What's in a black hole and could we fly a spaceship inside one? Now this one sounds like a lot of fun. Do you reckon we could do some interstellar field work on this? Sure, I don't see a problem with that. Step one, get a spaceship. Easy. Easy. I'll just call NASA. No problem there. Step two, slightly trickier. We're going to need a black hole. So let's ask everybody's favourite astrophysicist, Dr Andrew Ponson, how they're made. Essentially, a black hole is so much stuff crammed into such a small amount of space that nothing can get out, not even light. So to form one, you just need to cram a lot of stuff into a very small space and then gravity takes over and you've got a black hole. If I wanted to make a black hole, what ingredients would I need? Pretty much anything. Um, if you if you crush stuff together hard enough, then you will make it so dense that uh, it, it starts to pull in stuff by its gravity really, really strongly, and that can just turn into a black hole. So you don't need any kind of special material. The main thing you need is that really immense crushing force and the best way we know of to get that is uh, at the end of the life of a really big star basically that the star has fuel it's nuclear fuel that it, it's burning in its core that creates lots of heat and keeps the thing from falling in on itself but when that fuel is exhausted there's no more energy to stop the thing from from just crushing itself into oblivion and that's exactly what happens at the end of the life of massive stars Oh, the end of the life of massive stars. I still weep for David Bowie. Oh, don't cry, Adam. He's rejoined his people now somewhere beyond Alpha Centauri. Anyway, maybe we don't need to make a black hole from scratch because there's plenty of them kicking about. There are an estimated 100 million of them just in our galaxy, the Milky Way. Well, space might be brewing with black holes, which we can't see. So how did we find out that they're there? The first person to conceive of a black hole was the Reverend John Michel, rector of Thornhill, a geologist and astronomer and one of the great unsung scientists in history. In 1783, he conceived of dark stars, so massive that even light could not escape their immense gravitational field. But his genius didn't stop there. Michel was also first to suggest that earthquakes travel in waves and he produced the first artificial magnet. However, it was mathematics that took black holes a step closer to acceptance. While serving in the German army in the First World War, Karl Schwarzschild solved Einstein's field equations and calculated how big a given mass would have to be to give it a gravitational pull strong enough to stop light escaping. The radius of a black hole. Hole. If you want to put it like that, yes. Even then, astronomers labelled black holes as absurd. Many refused to accept that a dead star could produce an invisible yet immense puncture in the very fabric of space-time. To be fair, they are a bit weird. Yes, and if they are by their very nature invisible, how can we ever really be sure they exist? This, in my own immense, almost infinite density, is a point that I put to physicist and all-round gravitational guru Professor Sheila Rowan. Now, I, I don't know about you... But I find this all quite difficult to conceive of. So the, just just the notion that something can get so big that it begins to pull in on itself is a, a little bit problematic for me. But can, how do we? Are they real? Are they? I mean, are they things that are out there in space, or are these just hypothesised entities because the maths and the physics says they have to be there? Oh, I think we've got good evidence that there are objects out there that behave just exactly as these predict black holes should. From looking at how stars move and how gas moves around regions of space tells us that there has to be a huge amount of mass squashed into a small region of space with super strong gravitational effects. You know, it's strong evidence there's a black hole there. But all the evidence we have is not direct, because of the nature of a black hole. They're black, we can't see them. We can't see them, that's true, for, for various different reasons. Perhaps more direct is the evidence from the recent observations by the LIGO experiment, which for the first time measured the ripples in space-time, the gravitational wave signature of two black holes spiralling in and smashing into one another and catastrophically merging to form a new black hole. So that was part of your experiment. Now you, you were part of that project. You must have been pretty pleased that we had some strong evidence for black holes as a result of LIGO. Absolutely. And it was, of course, a big international experiment. And it was particularly exciting that the first signals we detected came from two black holes. 
big black holes, one about 36 times the mass of our own sun, the other one about 29 times the mass of our own sun. Bigger, in fact, than, than we'd been first searching for. LIGO really is one of the great discoveries of the 21st century, don't you think? Demonstrating gravitational waves exist, confirming general relativity. Yes, and they did it with the observation of two absolutely humongous black holes smashing into each other. Okay, now back to the interstellar fieldwork. We set ourselves the challenge of flying into a black hole. Hannah, did NASA come good on the spaceship? Yes, they were surprisingly amenable. (laughs) Yeah, it's parked out on the roof outside. Now, we've just got to decide which one of us gets to go I say we flip a coin flip a coin here we go and equal heads heads it is boom I'm going to space and we have lift off the hope for the future rests squarely on the shoulders of the first fry in space ah it's nice up here now let's just check with Andrew Ponson what's going to happen to me on this super exciting once in a lifetime trip Actually, the first thing you'd notice as you dive into the black hole is the tidal forces become so strong that they're essentially pulling your head much harder than they're pulling your toes, say, and, and you just get what people call it spaghettified because <laughs> you get kind of stretched out. Um, and that's the first thing you'd notice. If you were made out of really, really <laughs> strong stuff, which I'm sure you are, you could, in theory, survive that. There's nothing that says there's no way you could survive that. If you could make yourself out of strong enough stuff, you could survive this stretching feeling. There are different theories about what you would find once you're inside the black hole. One of the possibilities that people have put forward is there'd be something called a firewall, which is kind of, as the name suggests, a fiery band of particles that you would encounter and they would burn you to a crisp as you went in. It doesn't sound like a fun thing to do, I'm I'm going to be honest. If nothing can leave the black hole, you wouldn't be able to tell anyone that that you were in there. Yeah, that's the sort of catch-22. You could dive into a black hole, find out what happens, but because you're inside a black hole, you can't send out any light that would get to anybody outside. And because nothing goes faster than the speed of light, actually, we think you couldn't send out any kind of information to the outside universe t- telling them what you'd seen and just the fact that you needed a bit of help too late to back out now fry okay so i'm either going to be stretched like spaghetti or fried to a crisp for science though but as sheila rowan told me the rest of us watching spaceship fry would actually see something completely different the image of of hannah as she approached if she was trying to wave to us from the spacecraft her waving would get slower until eventually as she got right to the edge of the event horizon it would kind of freeze her and she'd also get dimmer again as the the wavelength of the light was stretched effectively by the effects of gravity I don't know why I'm if laughing I'm... so much about that but <laughs> please continue in this horrible experiment <laughs> The gravitational pull pulls on everything, and so it pulls on the information that's trying to escape. So she'd get fainter and dimmer and slower and then be frozen on the edge. (laughs) This is hilarious. If I send her to a black hole, you're telling me that Hannah's going to get slower and dimmer. That's how it would look to us. (laughs) Um, But to her, it would be a different experience, and that's relativity for you. I don't want to do it anymore, Adam. I don't want to get slower and dimmer. Hannah, it happens to us all as we get older. Anyway, relativity tells us that the same event viewed by observers at different places may not look the same. What about from my perspective, then? What's going to happen as I approach the centre of a black hole? Well, assuming that you're still sort of alive, despite being spaghettified, you would notice that you are forever being drawn further in towards the very centre of the black hole. It's technically called a singularity, and it's where all the stuff that fell into the black hole has piled up. So that single point is infinitely small and also infinitely dense. Do I end up as just a string of atoms? Well, eventually, presumably not even the atoms can survive because these forces do just get so ridiculously large, everything gets ripped apart. This doesn't sound like a lot of fun. No, I mean, it's not, it's not going to be good news. Uh, But more importantly than the fate of Hannah Fry... Surely not. Yes, is the fate of physics itself. Because eventually all our numbers just kind of blow up. We just can't reconcile the predictions of relativity, which is what ultimately is telling us about these uh, forces ripping you apart and getting bigger and bigger until they're infinite, versus quantum mechanics, which is supposed to tell us about how small little things actually behave. And so really the 
the worst news from all of this is that physics is in real trouble because we just don't know what happens when you get to the centre of a black hole. Worse news than my death. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, well in, the, in, the big, in the big picture, you have to take the big picture of these things. Which is more important, physics or me? Physics. <laughs> so, Dr Rutherford, when it comes to the question, what's inside a black hole, can we say case solved? Well, the answer is everything that's ever gone into it. But we don't really know what state it will be in. And we'll never know for sure until someone travels inside. The journey will be perilous. You'll either be spaghettified, fried, or crushed. Or a combination of all three. But from the outside, you'll just get slower and dimmer. Normally, which often struck me in the character of my friend Sherlock Holmes was that, although in his methods of thought he was the neatest and most methodical of mankind, and although also he affected a certain quiet primness of dress, he was nonetheless in his personal habits one of the most untidy men that ever drove a fellow lodger to distraction. Not that I'm in the least conventional in that respect myself. Rough and tumble work in Afghanistan, coming on top of a natural bohemianism of dispensation, has made me rather more lax than befits a medical man. But with me there is a limit, and when I find a man who keeps his cigars in the curl scuttle, his tobacco in the toe end of a Persian slipper, and his unanswered correspondence transfixed by a jackknife into the very centre of his wooden mantelpiece, then I begin to give myself virtuous airs. I've always held, too, that pistol practice should be distinctly an open-air pastime, and when Holmes, in one of his queer humours, would sit in an armchair with his hair trigger and a hundred boxer cartridges, and proceed to adorn the opposite wall with a patriotic VR done in bullet pox. I felt strongly that neither the atmosphere nor the appearance of our room was improved by it. Our chambers were always full of chemicals and of criminal relics, which had a way of wandering into unlikely positions and of turning up in the butter dish or in even less desirable places. But his papers were my great crux. He had a horror of destroying documents, especially those which were connected with his past cases, and yet it was only once in every year or two that he would muster energy to dock it and arrange them. For as I have mentioned somewhere in these incoherent memoirs, the outbursts of passionate energy when he performed the remarkable feats with which his name is associated were followed by reactions of lethargy, during which he would lie about with his violin and his books, hardly moving save from the sofa to the table. Thus month after month his papers accumulated, until every corner of the room was stacked with bundles of manuscript, which were on no account to be burned, and which could not be put away save by their owner. One winter's night, as we sat together by the fire, I ventured to suggest to him that, as he had finished pasting extracts into his commonplace book, he might employ the next two hours in making our room a little more habitable. He could not deny the justice of my request, so with a rather rueful face he went off to his bedroom, from which he returned presently, pulling a large tin box behind him. This he placed in the middle of the floor, and squatting down upon its tool in front of it, he threw back the lid. I could see that it is already a third full of bundles of paper tied up with red tape into separate packages. Mm -hmm. 
was in a state of silent agitation all the way to Woodley. She had evidently never been there before, and although she little dreamt I knew anything of her early story, I could perceive she was in a tremor at the thought of seeing the place which might have been her home, and round which it is probable that many of her innocent girlish imaginations had clustered. It was a long drive there through paved jolting lanes. Miss Matilda sat bolt upright and looked wistfully out of the windows as we drew near the end of her journey. The aspect of the country was quiet and pastoral. Woodley stood among fields, and there's an old-fashioned garden where roses and currant bushes touched each other and where the feathery asparagus formed a pretty background to the pinks and gillyflowers. There's no drive up to the door. We got out at a little gate, walked up a straight box-edged path. My cousin might make a drive, I think, said Miss Pearl, who was afraid of Yarek and had only her cap on. I think it is very pretty said Miss Matty, with a soft plaintiveness in her voice, and almost in a whisper. The Justin Mr. Holbrook appeared at the door, rubbing his hands in very effervescence of hospitality. He looked more like my idea of Don Quixote than ever, and yet the likeness was only external. His respectable housekeeper stood modestly at the door to bid us welcome and while she led the elder ladies upstairs to a bedroom, I begged to look about the garden. My request evidently pleased the old gentleman, who took me all round the place, and showed me his six and twenty cars, named after the different letters of the alphabet. As we went along, he surprised me occasionally by repeating apt and beautiful quotations from the poets ranging easily from Shakespeare and George Herbert to those of our own day. He did this as naturally as we were thinking aloud, and the true and beautiful words were the best expression he could find for what he was thinking or feeling. To be sure, he called Baron my Lord Biron, and pronounced the name of Goethe strictly in accordance with the English sound of the letters, as Goethe says, ye ever verdant palaces, etc., Altogether, I never met with a man before or since who had spent so long a life in a secluded and not impressive country, with ever-increasing delight in the daily and yearly change of the season and beauty. When he and I went in, we found the dinner was nearly ready in the kitchen, for so I suppose the room ought to be called, as there were oak dresses and cupboards all round, all over by the side of the fireplace and only a small turkey carpet in the middle of the flag floor. The room might have been easily made into a handsome dark egg dining parlour by removing the oven and a few other appurtenances of a kitchen, which were evidently never used, the rare cooking place being at some distance. The room in which we were expected to sit was a stiffly furnished, ugly apartment, but that in which we did sit was what Mr. Holbrook called the counting house, where he paid his labourers their weekly wages at a great desk near the door. The rest of the pretty sitting room, looking into the orchard and all covered over with dancing tree shadows, was filled with books. They lay on the ground, they covered the walls, they strolled the table. He was evidently half ashamed and half proud of his extravagance in this respect. There were of all kinds, poetry and wild weird tales prevailing. He evidently chose his books in accordance with his own tastes, not because such and such were classical or established favourites. Chapter 7 of The Old-Fashioned Fairy Book by Constance Carey Harrison
The Fairies and the Fiddler In the pretty little village of Hayfield, not far from the borders of a thick forest, lived a good-natured, idle fellow named Simon, who supported his wife and two children by trapping or shooting in winter and by fishing or doing odd jobs of harvest work in summer. Simon could play upon the fiddle in a way to make the tears come into your eyes, or if he chose to be merry, his tunes would set every foot in motion as the wind starts the leaves upon an aspen tree. This accomplishment caused him to be much in demand among the young people of the village, who dropped many a bit of silver into his worn old hat, and at all the weddings and barn dances, Simon might be seen with a huge bunch of flowers in his buttonhole, and his fiddle under his arm, footing it in the procession. Then, too, Simon was the best man in the village to coax stories from, especially the old-time gossip about the little folk in green, for whom in former days Hayfield had been famous. Simon knew how the fairies dressed, what they ate and drank, how they punished saucy human beings who offended them, and could point out the smooth rings of short fine grass where they had held their midnight revels. That the fairies really had haunted Hayfield and its surrounding woods, nobody in the village doubted. They had heard too many things to prove it from their grandparents, whose parents were said to have lived on the best of terms with the little people, setting pans of cream by the hearthstone at night for them to skim, leaving, when the holidays came around, a cheese and bag of nuts in a hollow tree at the entrance of the wood, and getting all sorts of kind offices from the fairies back again. Although it had now been a long time since any one could testify to having actually seen a fairy, as it was well known that the band were frightened out of Hayfield, when the first stagecoach, with its noise and clatter, took to dashing along the village street, many people believed the men in green to be still lurking in the neighbourhood. What else could account for the trouble some of the good wives had with their butter and their bees? What could it be but fairy thumps and pinches that kept the lazy folk from sleeping soundly? When their houses were knocked to rights before they went to bed? And what could explain the silver penny often found in the shoe of a tidy housekeeper when up she jumped at break of day to set her maids to work? For fairies never show by day, and it is only when the people of a house are fast asleep and snoring that they glide in by keyholes through cracks and broken panes of glass, and swarm over the rooms, spying out everything amiss, and leaving tracks on the dust of shelves or tables, scattering the ashes of an unswept hearth, and bewitching the inside of a dirty iron pot, so that it never more may cook sweet porridge. Of all the villagers, as I have said, Simon alone professed to have any recent acquaintance with the little folk, and the wonder was how they, who were known to be sworn enemies to idleness, could keep him in their favour. Simon's house was a poor little cottage on the outskirts of the town. His wife, once a pretty, rosy lass, had taken to drink, and the husband and children led a dog's life within doors. Consequently, their one pleasure was to roam the woods and fields, and the children were growing up brown and barefoot as two young gypsies. They were a boy named Timothy and a girl named Bess, of whom Simon was very proud, their fresh young faces making a strong contrast with his wizened visage, crossed with a hundred lines and topped with a sunburned mop of hair. As they grew old enough to understand, their father instructed them in all the arts of woodcraft, there was no tree or plant for which he had not a name or a virtue. The habits of all birds and fishes and animals were as familiar to him as their haunts. In this way, the vast green forest, with its great tree boles and twisted boughs, its verdant moss carpet and hidden streams, became to them an enchanted world, through which the children strayed like a sylvan king and queen. A sad change it was to come back to the dirt and confusion of their miserable home, where the mother received them either with grudging welcome if they brought berries or a string of brook trout, or with blows and drunken curses if they came empty-handed. As his wife's intemperance increased, Simon stayed less and less at home, and the children dreaded lest some day their poor father would be driven to desert them altogether.' 
So they resolved to keep a close watch on his movements and to follow him should he go away. One night, the harvest moon was riding her glorious way across the heavens, and the little village of Hayfield lay steeped in silver light. Not a lamp or a taper glimmered in the hamlet, and every one of the brown thatched cottages was buried in profound repose. Not even a watchdog barked, and the forest leaves yielded to the universal spell and ceased to rustle. There had been held a harvest home that day, and Simon had been hard at work with his fiddle, playing jigs and reels for the dance in the squire's great barn. Between every dance, he had quenched his thirst at the cider barrel, or quaffed the big brown mug of beer they kept brimming at his side. Naturally, Simon's brain was a little the worse for such free potations, and when the last strains of the wind that shakes the barley had died upon his fiddle strings, and all the gay company had gone their homeward way, Simon, with his pocket full of silver pennies, staggered out into the field and lay down under a haystack to take his well earned rest. There, just before midnight, his two children, who had come in search of him, found their father peacefully sleeping, his fiddle on his breast. Not wishing to disturb him, the children decided to have their own night's sleep in the same fragrant nest of hay and curling up at some little distance from the slumbering fiddler, they whispered together for a while, and then were about to drop asleep. Just as their eyes were closing, they heard an odd sound, as of hundreds of little pattering feet, and out from the shadow of the wood came into the unbroken argent of the field a long train of little men, women and children, dressed magnificently in cobweb gauze and green, bespangled with glittering gems, and wearing each a tiny crimson cap with a golden bell upon its peak. The two children were broad awake in a moment, for they knew that these were the fairies they had so longed to see, all dressed in holiday costume, and proceeding to their famous midsummer festival. The procession wavered like a gleaming snake across the field, and when passing near the haystack, came to a halt. To the children's surprise, Two queer little old men, holding carved ivory wands, came straight up and tapped the sleeping fiddler across the bridge of his nose. "'Nay, I will play no more for you, you light of head and light of heel,' said sleepy Simon, believing himself to be still perched upon the barrel that served as the fiddler's throne. "'Aye, but play you shall at his majesty's command.' said the little old man, thumping him more sharply. "'Isn't that part of your bargain with us? If we allow the trout to haunt your brook, and the hares to run into your traps? Come, mortal, up with you and follow. Here's the bandage to blindfold your eyes as usual, and remember that, if you peep, you are our prisoner for life.' By this time thoroughly awakened, Simon stumbled upon his feet, and stood making abject bows before the angry little fairy chamberlains. He let his eyes be bound with a green silk ribbon, and leading strings were passed around his waist. At the blast of a golden trumpet, the procession moved forward with a sound of tripping feet and whirring gauzy wings, and tinkling bells most lovely to the ear. Last of all came Simon, in fairy leading strings, and the two children, unable to resist the impulse, followed noiselessly. Their way led again into the forest, through the dense underwood, to a smooth circle of velvet sward, set around with hundreds of little mushrooms, on which the fairies took their seats. In the centre was a hammock of silver cobweb, swinging by jewelled chains from the crossed stems of two tall white lilies, under a bower of maidenhair ferns. Sweet blue violets were sprinkled in the grass, making a path where the king and queen of the fairies marched to take their places on the cobweb throne. Dew was handed around in acorn cups, of which the fairy guests sipped daintily, followed by bark trays containing every variety of fairy refreshment. There were delicate fried butterflies, marrow bones of a field mouse, snail soup served in nutshells, and wild strawberries in baskets made of moss. When the banquet was at an end, 
The Chamberlains gave notice to Simon, who had been bound with ropes made of plaited grass to the trunk of a wide-spreading oak. The fiddle struck up a tune, and at once the dance began. Such a mad and merry dance the wandering children had never seen before. Old and young joined hands and trod a circle, then, breaking the chain, formed into a hundred fantastic figures, and at each touch of a light footstep the earth opened to give birth to a flower, until the entire fairy ring was enamelled with fragrant blossoms. Fast flew the fiddle bow, but faster flew the tiny feet, and when the mirth was at its height, Simon, who, as we know, had taken a drop too much, was suddenly inspired to tear the bandage from his eyes and crying, "'It's my turn now!' capered right into the middle of the magic ring. The honest fellow had meant no harm, but his offence was a mortal one. Instantly he was surrounded by a swarm of the furious little men in green, who, without waiting for an excuse, stabbed out both his eyes, and taking away his fiddle and bow, bound his arms behind his back. Again the procession, this time sad and silent, was formed, and the king, striking the nearest tree with his wand, it flew open. The whole party, leading Simon behind them, entered the aperture, and before the children knew where to turn, it had closed upon their father. And now, in what a distressing condition were the unhappy Timothy and Bess! Not knowing what better to do, they sat down at the foot of the great oak tree, which had swallowed up their father, and from sheer weariness fell asleep. When morning came, and the birds piped upon the boughs, the children awoke and looked in wonder about them. All was dewy, green, and fragrant in the deep woods, but no sign remained of the fairy revel, except a fine fringe of newly sprung grass, growing in a circle where their ring had been. The bark of the great oak tree was unbroken, and above stretched a broad canopy of dark green leaves, which whispered in the morning breeze, but told no tales of what the children longed to know. Hunger drove them to retrace their steps homeward, and when they reached the cottage, their mother was so cross at her husband's failure to fetch the usual stock of silver pennies earned at the harvest home, that she beat them both soundly, and gave them but a dry crust apiece for breakfast. Still the children hoped their father might return, and, not knowing to whom to confide their wonderful tale, they kept silence. When it was found Simon had disappeared in earnest, all the wise heads in Hayfield decided that he had run away to escape from his good wife's tongue, an act of independence which had the bad effect of making more than one married man in the village unduly restless. A month passed, and the two children were again wandering in the forest, trying to find a few berries to appease their hunger, for things at home were now worse than before. When they fancied they heard a child crying close at hand, they searched everywhere, and at length the sound was renewed, seeming to come from a thicket of tall ferns. Falling on their knees, the children worked their way under the bushes, and through the brakes, until they came in view of a lovely chubby elf sitting forlorn upon a mushroom on a hillock of soft green moss, beneath a screen of ferns and wild flowers, and letting fall a flood of tears from his big blue eyes. He wore no clothing, if we may accept a pair of drooping wings, and in his hand he held a stalk of snowy lilies. "'Who are you, dear little one, and how came you here?' they asked. I am a fairy, the tiny creature sobbed. Last night was the monthly revel, and we sported till the moon set. But I saw these lilies growing over in yonder swamp, and I wanted them so, and as I ran, they seemed to run too. I had such hard work to gather them. When at last I succeeded, my red cap dropped off, and without it I am as helpless as a mere mortal. While searching for the cap, which I have not found, a cock in the village crowed, and the fairies all fled away and left me. The door of the mound is closed, and for a whole long month there is no hope of my getting in again. Oh, I wish I could find my cap!' 
If we help you find the cap, will you stop crying? said the children. The shivering sprite wiped his eyes and promised that he would weep no more. The girl wrapped him in her apron, and then all three of them set out in search of the missing treasure. At last Timothy saw in the water around some reeds a red object which a bullfrog was opening his mouth to swallow, and wading into the stream, he was able to rescue the magic cap, dry it in the sun, and restore it to its happy little owner. And now, said the smiling elf, who appeared to have suddenly grown old and wise, as for a whole long month I am without a home, what do you say to taking me to yours? You will never regret it. That I promise you. The children told their new friend what a poor place their home was, but the elf smiled and shook his head as if he knew what he was about. He bade the children lead him to their cottage, and once across the threshold of the wretched place, where the drunken mother was sleeping heavily on a pallet of straw in the loft above, the elf took his perch upon the mantel shelf. Next, since I am obliged to live with mortals, let me see what the magic cap can do. He put on the cap and immediately disappeared from the children's sight. When night came, Timothy fell asleep, but Bess watched, and at midnight she saw her new friend appear upon the hearth, conducting a perfect army of little workmen and workwomen. He waved his cap thrice around his head, and at once little carpenters set to building up the cottage walls, little whitewashers made the ceilings wholesome, little painters covered all the woodwork with a coat of yellow. By sunrise, what a change! The broken bricks of the floor were transformed into pretty blue and white tiles, lattice windows took the place of their old and dim ones, the pots and pans were scoured until they shone, roses looked in at the outer door, where rows of larkspur and of gillyflower, of bachelor's button and love in a mist were growing on either side of a neat flagged wall to the garden gate. Instead of Timothy's old straw mattress, the boy lay on a clean white bed, and his sister, who had kept awake all night in utter wonderment, falling asleep at dawn because her eyes refused to stay open any longer, found him shaking her arm and begging her to come and share in the nice hot breakfast that, wonder of wonders, their mother, sober and clean and smiling, had made ready at the fire. It was a day of marvels. The mother seemed to have entirely forgotten her past degraded life and was once more the brisk and rosy woman Simon had fallen in love with. A dozen times a day she paused in her spinning, or weaving, or baking, to run to the gate and wonder when dear father would come back. Timothy worked in the garden, Bess sewed and helped her mother, not daring to tell what she alone knew of the magic change. That night Bess slept, and Timothy kept watch. At midnight the fairy appeared upon the hearth, leading a dozen little bakers in white caps and aprons. Now make ready fifty loaves of your best white bread, that the good wife may sell them on the morrow, the fairy ordered, and at once the tiny men set to work mixing and kneading and baking, and at daybreak there were fifty of the sweetest white loaves money could buy. The fame of Simon's widow soon spread through the village, and everyone was eager to see the wonderful reform worked in her, no less than in her cottage. Her bread was bought up as fast as she could furnish it, and next night Bess watched while Timothy slept. Then Bess saw the fairy appear at midnight, followed by a swarm of bees like a cloud. Make fifty pounds of your clearest honey, that the good wife may sell it on the morrow. The bees flew out of the door, and next morning the hives were found overflowing with luscious honey that smelt like a bed of clover all ablow. Next night came the bakers, and next night again the bees. Money flowed into the widow's purse as rapidly as it had once flowed out. Now was there lacking but one thing to complete their happiness, and that was the return of Simon to his family. Bess and Timothy together planned what they should do, and when the month had passed away, and the night of the full moon had come once more, neither went to bed, but both hid 
watching for the coming of the sprite. Exactly at twelve o'clock, their kind little friend made his appearance, and summoning cooks and bees, ordered them to keep up their service on alternate nights until the dame's coffers should be full to last a lifetime. Seeing him about to take leave, out rushed Timothy and Best, threw themselves on their knees before the fairy, and thanking him a thousand times over for his goodness, begged for one more act of grace, their father's release and restoration to his family. The fairy looked graver than they had ever seen him, and his brows puckered in a frown. "'Your father has committed an offence we never pardon,' he said after a short silence. "'He has been punished according to our laws, and must abide by the sentence, which is imprisonment for life.' The children burst into tears at this, and cried so that the fairy sneezed several times. "'I believe I am taking cold in all this dampness,' he said, shivering slightly. "'Come, dry up that deluge, and say good-bye to me. The utmost I can do is to look up your father when I get back again, and tell him you are well and happy. I suppose you do not know that for some years past he has been attending our holiday frolics as musician, since our own best player broke his arm. Simon was under oath never to look at us, or to betray us, and this was the first time he transgressed. But our laws are very strict, and I am afraid to bid you even hope to see him again. One thing I may tell you. The King's chief counsellor has a mantle of red, worked with a device of six golden birds flying into a serpent's open jaws. If you should ever find that mantle, walk boldly to the oak tree in the forest, knock three times, and cry, The King's chief counsellor! Then you may be able to secure your father's freedom, but not else. And now, good-bye to you. The good elf vanished, and Timothy and Bess spent more time than ever in the forest. They had now taken their mother into the secret, for she, poor woman, had become as gentle and loving as she had before been hard and cruel. The one desire of the entire family was to get possession of the chief counsellor's mantle, but nothing seemed more unlikely. A year passed, and Timothy had gone out to look at his rabbit trap without particularly thinking of what it might contain, when a tremendous bustle inside attracted his attention. Cautiously he lifted the door, and up sprang an angry little man in green, having a long white beard and a hump upon his back, who vanished from sight as quickly as he had appeared. Timothy lamented the loss of such unusual game, and then espied at the bottom of the trap nothing less than a tiny cloak of red, embroidered with six golden birds flying into a serpent's open jaws. He made a joyful dive after the little garment, but, strange to say, it stuck tight to the fingers of his right hand, dragging after it the trap. Timothy shook it and pulled at it in vain, there it was, and not to be dislodged. He ran home and called Bess to his assistance. The little girl came out, and no sooner had she touched her brother than she stuck fast to him. The mother flew to the rescue, and became fastened to her daughter, and there they all were, in a long string, not knowing whether to laugh or cry at their strange predicament. The only thing was to make a pilgrimage to the oak tree in the forest. Timothy's dog followed them, and rubbed against his master's coat. He too stuck fast, and so did Bessie's cat. Everybody they passed upon the way was attracted to the queer family party, and before long a little army of curious people were compelled to walk along in the direction of the forest. Timothy did not know the secret of the little cloak, which had power to attract everything to it, drawing even people's thoughts out of their hearts, as a magnet draws the needle. Only in fairyland could the object so attracted be set free. When they reached the oak tree in the forest, Timothy struck upon it three times, and called with a bold voice, though not without a trembling of the legs, for the king's chief counsellor. 
the bark of the great tree cleft slowly open, and out came the same old white-bearded fairy he had captured in the rabbit trap. Bowing with mock humility, the old fellow asked what the visitors would be pleased to have. "'I demand my father, and also to be rid of this wretched little rag,' said Timothy hotly. "'Step inside! Step inside!' said the elf with a malicious smile, for he knew that, once within, he might get the audacious mortals in his power, and force them to work his gold mines. "'Not a step will I go inside until I see my father,' said Timothy firmly. "'Then here you may abide,' cried the old man, turning white with rage." Timothy put one hand within the tree, holding the magic mantle at arm's length. "'I demand my father!' he cried in a loud voice. The power of the mantle did not fail, for rising from the darkness within came poor blind Simon, stretching his arm toward his child, but holding tight his fiddle. At the moment Timothy's hand had come inside the fairy kingdom, the spell of enchantment was broken, and all of the strangely linked people were set free. Simon's wife and children threw their arms around him and welcomed his return, while his neighbours shook his hand in warm congratulation. As for the old fairy, he fairly danced with rage. With the mantle in Timothy's possession, half the chief councillor's power and reputation for wisdom would pass away. He offered rich bribes of gold and jewels. He threatened. He howled. He grinned. He hurled curses on their heads. But Timothy was firm. Then name your price, you wretch, cried the angry fairy. It is that you shall restore my father's eyesight, said Timothy. This went very hard with the wicked old elf who had been congratulating himself that Simon would bear away at least one mark of fairy vengeance. But he had met his match in Timothy, and there was no escape for the chief counsellor, who, diving down into the cavern beneath the hollow tree, reappeared fetching a box of magic ointment, which, rubbed upon Simon's eyes, made them better than ever. When Simon saw not only the light of day, but his two dear children, and his wife looking as he had known her in blooming youth, he uttered a cry of delight. Then, to relieve his feelings, he struck up the old wind that shakes the barley, when, behold, not only all the people there assembled, but a score of little green folk, who had been in hiding, enjoying the discomfiture of the cross old counsellor, began to foot it on the greensward. Simon himself danced, and the old counsellor, sorely against his will, was forced to skip until his legs ached, for Timothy still held the mantle in his hand. At last, when all were out of breath, the elf received his mantle. With a storm of angry words, he disappeared from sight. Immediately the sky darkened, a cold wind blew and a shower of hailstones fell upon our friends, sending them scampering and laughing away from the region where the fairy spite prevailed. Under the spell of the kind little sprite who had been their guest, the cottage was never approached by any unkind visitors. Simon fiddled and grew fat. His wife remained as sweet as fresh cream to the last day of her life, and their children came to be the pride of all the village. So far as I have heard, that is the last visit Hayfield has had from the little men in green. End of chapter 7 